Thank you, uh, first of all, for the invitation to speak at uh, this conference. Uh, it's a very interesting programme, but I'm acutely conscious that I am a political historian with only the most tenuous appreciation for either law or legal history. Uh, so out of respect to the intelligence of everyone here, I'm not going to really pretend otherwise. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on the area of the values set out in um, the proclamation and their politics, and as the title of the programme puts it, uh, 1919 as a root of title, a somewhat legal title for a paper with no law in it. Um, the year 1919 is a pivotal date in Irish history and is effectively the constitutional foundation stone of the modern Irish state. Strictly speaking, the state dates itself from 1922 with the foundation of the Irish Free State under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. But I would suggest out of, um, outside of particular circles, there's not really a great deal of affection for that particular date, which represents a bitterly contested compromise wrested from Britain. 1919 is not officially a part of the history of the actual state itself, but it has a semi-official status in the sense that we still count our parliaments from the one uh, that was elected at the 1918 general election. And the record of our houses of the Oireachtas begins with the first public meeting of the first all in the Mansion House on the 21st of January 1919. Uh, it's not something we do with our governments, for instance, but it is, I think, the only aspect of the pre-1922 independence movement that remains part of the architecture of the modern state. The first all was a non-violent revolutionary act, which had its basis in a mandate from the Irish people. As Michael Laffin pointed out, in two quite different respects, the meeting of the First Dáil was an act of great symbolic importance. Not only did it inaugurate the democratic and constitutional history of independent Ireland, but it also represented a synthesis of two different traditions within Irish nationalism, combining the uh, military and political traditions uh, within Irish nationalism, and was, he says, the product of cooperation between soldiers and politicians which had begun in the period following the 1916 Rising. It also dramatically ended, uh, the, uh, or dramatically marked the end of a different political tradition in Ireland, uh, with the Irish Parliamentary Party having been effectively wiped out in the election which preceded it. In a sense, then, it marks the continuity of the Irish parliamentary tradition, if you like, but with an entirely new set of actors. So it's not necessary to rehearse the origins of the first all, except just note a couple of things. For one thing, it is a direct consequence of the events of Easter week uh, and the reorganisation of the iteration of Sinn Féin, which uh, grew out of that. Um, and Sinn Féin at this point is more of a, a sort of a collective rallying cry than a political party in a conventional sense. Uh, and of course, Labour, which had been founded only a few years earlier, famously did not contest the 1918 election. So the contest was a straight fight between uh, Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party, making it, in effect, a referendum about separatism. As Frank Gallagher put it, there had been no concealment of what Sinn Féin stood for. It stood for, firstly, uh, that it was for Ireland, a republic, the people were being asked to vote for. Uh, secondly, that those elected would not attend the British Commons, but would remain in Ireland to set up a national assembly. And thirdly, that the assembly would assert full sovereign independence. The Sinn Féin landslide which followed saw the party take 73 of 105 seats. Uh, they would not take their seats in Westminster, uh, but there was a question mark over what they would actually do next. A parliament with Sinn Féin deputies would, uh, of Sinn Féin deputies only would be problematic with so many of them in prison. But the suggestion that they convene a national assembly which would include representatives of, say, labour groups and, and other um, national organisations would be difficult because that would dilute the legitimacy of the idea of the mandate that they had secured uh, in 1918. So um, if they were going to establish a representative government, they believed that the mandate was crucial. Tom Johnson of the Labour Party had told a newspaper at the time that the party was willing to act as a left wing within the National Assembly, and the Labour leaders were reported to have been distinctly put out at not having been invited to take part in a broader uh, group. But they said nothing in public, and they would be placated soon enough. On the 7th of January, some 29 of the Sinn Féin MPs attended a preliminary private meeting in the Oak Room of the Mansion House of what they called the Dáil Éireann. Uh, as uh, 
They resolved that we, the Republican members of the Irish constituencies, in accordance with the national will, are empowered to call together the Dáil Éireann and proceed accordingly, uh, which they duly did, assembling at the round room of the Mansion House at 3.30 on the 21st of January 1919, in a room packed full of ticket holders, invited guests and uh, press from Ireland and abroad. After a prayer read in Irish by Father Flanagan, there was a roll call of all those elected in 1918 with the refrain Feigot e Galov for every Sinn Féin member in prison on the day, while the Unionist and Home Rule MPs were marked as Lohar. Uh, then Bunrock Dáil Éireann was read uh, in Irish only and adopted. So the constitution of Dáil Éireann consisted of five articles and was a very straightforward framework for organising the work of Parliament and its ministers. Uh, Article 1 stated that all legislative powers shall be vested in Dáil Éireann, composed of deputies elected by the Irish people from the existing Irish parliamentary constituencies. Article 2 are outlined the composition of the Ministry of the Dáil and the election of the President. Article 3 referred to the Chairman of the Dáil. Article 4 related to Money Acts and Article 5 stated that the Constitution and provisions therein was liable to all alteration within, um, after seven days uh, notice. Uh, an English language version was provided to the press only on the day and later adopted when the Dáil met again on the 1st of April, uh, when much of the business of the day was amendments to the standing orders and to the constitution of Dáil Éireann, including a motion moved by Eamon de Valera and seconded by Countess Markovic that deputies shall be referred to by the names of their constituencies, and also that no deputy shall make a personal charge against another nor use offensive remarks about another. Uh, thus adding guidelines for the civility of proceedings, which had up until this point been remarkably civil anyway, but more curiously adopting the Westminster custom uh, regarding names. Uh, Brian Farrell has observed that the presentation of the constitution was almost dismissive and that, it did less than uh, and that it did it less than justice considering it was the first fundamental law of modern Ireland and was to remain the basis of the Irish state until the adoption of the Irish Free State Constitution in 1922. Certainly the emphasis in the rhetoric of proceedings of the opening session of the first all is on the parliament and the people who elected it rather than on any government arising out of it and any structures that that might have. It is interesting though that when the doll met for the third time and this time de Valera was present for the first time having just got out of prison that the focus shifted to the structures of government and the rules of the house. But after the role and the rules, uh, the meeting had before it three main items of business. Uh, the first, uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, then a message to the free nations of the world calling for the recognition of Ireland's independence, and finally the adoption of the democratic programme. Now, the message to the free nations of the world, which was read in Irish, English, and in French, was an appeal for recognition of Ireland's national status and to her right and her right to its vindication at the Paris Peace Conference. But the other two documents are of more lasting relevance, and they're the ones that I'm going to focus on uh, here. Recalling the meeting of the first doll some decades later in his book, The Four Glorious Years, Frank Gallagher noted that the Declaration of Independence made by Dáil Éireann that day is historically the most important document in the archives of modern Ireland. Now, the Declaration of Independence is just 400 words long and effectively updates the proclamation in the context of the new national parliament. It can be boiled down to the idea that where the, um, what they say, the Irish Republic was proclaimed on Easter Monday by the Irish Republican army acting on behalf of the people, now the people had declared its allegiance to the Republic through a democratic vote. So the roots of the Republic in centuries of physical force right up to 1916 are, are articulated, but it is confirmed by the legitimacy uh, with a mandate. Now, Frank Gallagher may have a case in saying that this Declaration of Independence is historically the most important document of modern Ireland, but it certainly never had this status. It is largely unremarked on by scholars, and I think almost entirely absent from the public consciousness. Uh, I doubt many people could quote a single sentence from it. And a very quick Google search brought up mostly pages relating to the 1916 proclamation. 
Now, partly it's uh, perhaps a, a consequence of the more formal legalistic language of the declaration. It's all and whereas, and whereas, and whereas, in comparison with the more elegant or perhaps more memorable proclamation. Uh, and it might be facile to suggest that the visionaries of the revolution had been executed after the rising. But nevertheless, the 1919 document lacks something of its predecessor. Looking at declarations of independence more broadly even, um, we can see that it lacks, say, the philosophical qualities that made the American Declaration of Independence stand the test of time in the public consciousness. There are no self-evident truths, just uh, a national polity, albeit one which is, quote, based on the people's will with equal right and equal opportunity for every citizen. But if the vision of the Republic is lacking from the Declaration of Independence, it can be found in the third document adopted by the Dáil on the first day, and that is the Democratic Programme. In fewer than 600 words, in the English language version, the programme laid out the principles on which the Irish Republic was to be built, those of liberty, equality and justice for all, where every man and woman will give their allegiance to, quote, the Commonwealth, and in return, each citizen would, re would receive an adequate share of the produce of the nation's labor, and where the government's first duty would be to ensure the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of every child. The program was not framed as a constitution as such, but it did outline the basic ethos and civic framework on which the new state would be built. Significantly, however, the word state is entirely absent from the document. In contrast, the 1922 Free State Constitution and its 1937 predecessor, or successor, both focused on drawing up the state's legal and political infrastructure, but the notion of citizenship and the rights and responsibilities it conferred was wholly absent. Um, and it's an absence which I think has been reflected then in the political culture of the state thereafter. In recent years, particularly in the context of the post-2008 uh, economic crisis and the political re-evaluation which followed, such as it was, this absence of a popular civic republicanism has been highlighted as a factor contributing to Ireland's national malaise by various commentators. This view has much to recommend it, although there is rarely, if ever, any acknowledgement of the voices which had previously called for the state to promote an active citizenship in the past, but which were readily ignored by those who held political power from the outset. So before looking at the document itself, though, I think it's worth looking at uh, the context in which it was written. So the genesis behind the programme was largely political and done with a view to an international audience. The Socialist International was meeting in Bern on the 3rd of February 1919, and two Labour men, Tom Johnson and uh, Cahill O'Shannon, an official in the Transport and General Workers Union, were planning to attend to lobby for support for Irish self-determination. Anything which might lend the progressive or radical credentials to the new government would surely strengthen the delegation's hand in Switzerland. Uh, Johnson was approached to write the Dáil Social Programme, something which might serve as a consolation to Labour, which had uh, stood aside in the 1918 election, and again when membership of the Assembly was not widened. There was also another consideration in asking Johnson, though, in that there were few others capable of doing the job. Part of the problem was that Sinn Féin, that broad alliance of polit uh, disparate political beliefs, had not given the issue a great deal of thought. Many of those who had been inclined towards political thinking had died in 1916, and their successor seemed for the most part of a less philosophical bent. Theirs was an attitude summed up in a story retold by Sean O'Foylon about the English journalist who, uh, after 1916, plied the General Secretary of Sinn Féin, Pauline O'Keefe, with so many insistent questions on the lines of, what are the practical aims of the movement? And got so many unsatisfactory answers that in the end, in some slight ex exasperation, he said, Mr. O'Keefe, would you at least say what exactly you yourself want? At this O'Keefe, a small, dar uh, dark, fiercely moustached Celt banged his desk and roared, Vengeance be Jesus! <laughs> Similarly, in his history of Sinn Féin between 1916 and 23, 
Michael Laffin has observed that Sinn Féin did not engage in the sort of intellectual debates which preoccupied many of their counterparts in other countries. Now, it would be wrong to suggest that these debates didn't take place at all. Uh, but within Sinn Féin, people who thought in a practical way about um, the nature of Irish society after the revolution, uh, people like Liam Mellows, were in a minority and tended to be on the left. For the rest, Connolly's idea of painting the post box as green did not really seem that objectionable at all. As such, another factor in Johnson being asked to write the programme was because he could and because there was no one in Sinn Féin who was equal to the job. So, in early January, Johnson was approached to write the Dáil Social and Economic Document. He began his draft by quoting from the 1916 proclamation and then from Pierce's last major pamphlet, The Sovereign People, which was uh, produced uh, in, or published in uh, March 1916. And it was in a deliberate attempt to link Easter week with the Dáil's need for a social policy. Uh, and he also did it to illustrate the influence which Connolly had had on Pierce uh, in, in later years. So in Pierce's words, the passage asserted that no private right to property is good against the public right of the nation. Wherever forms of productive wealth are wrongfully used, the nation shall resume possession without compensation. The draft continued in a similar vein, asserting that the Irish Republic shall always count wealth and prosperity by the measure of health and happiness of its citizens and as such the first duty of the government of the republic would be to make provision for the physical mental and spiritual well-being of uh, the children it set out how nat natural resources would be exploited for the good of the people and how where productive wealth was wrongfully used or withheld from use to the detriment of the republic there the nation shall resume possession without compensation. Having dealt with trade and noting that it shall be the purpose of the government to encourage the organisation of people into trade unions and cooperative societies with a view to control and administration of the industry by the workers engaged in the industries, finally it concluded that the Republic will aim at the elimination of the class and society which lives upon the wealth produced by the workers of the nation but gives no useful service in return and in the process of accomplishment will bring freedom to all uh, who have hitherto been caught in the toils of economic servitude. So it's quite a far-reaching document um, and was submitted but it was far from the last word since, uh, as Andrea Socassi has noted, the Republicans were not minded to let the programme go through on the nod, surprisingly enough. Michael Collins called a meeting of leading members of the IRB for the eve of the inaugural session of the Dáil to, con uh, to consider the programme. And according to PSO Hegarty, one of those present, he says, the democratic programme gave rise to a lively debate, the preponderance of opinion being against it. It was urged that this declaration was in fact ultra vires for the Dáil, whose one and only business was to get the English out of Ireland, and that all internal and arguable questions like this should be left over until the English had actually been got out. And on a vote, that view was upheld. Collins then said that he would suppress the democratic programme, and he did so. But next morning, the others refused to go um, without a democratic programme, and a draft was handed to Sean T. O'Kelly, who finally produced what was put before the door. So O'Kelly's recollection differed somewhat, but as O'Kahasi observes, his description of how the draft was received rings true. Uh, in a long and sometimes heated discussion, um, there were ideas and statements which some of the committee would not accept. The discussion lasted until well after 11 o'clock. Eventually, the meeting broke up without any agreement. All notes and suggestions were thrown at me because I was the chairman. I was told to draft the document myself. So as O'Kahasi observes, O'Shannon thought that the Sinn Féin executive, with O'Kelly's own support, overruled the IRB objections. And O'Kelly was given the task of rendering Johnson's original document into something which the IRB would find less objectionable. So O'Kelly worked through the night cutting extensively, editing other sections, but adding very little of his own. He removed some of the more radical elements in the text, including the elimination of the capitalist class and the confiscation of misused property and rephrasing other sections. 
Years later, O'Shannon went and compared the original draft to the final version and found that only half of the Johnson's uh, draft was, uh, was omitted. But once O'Kelly had finished his revisions, there was a rush to have the final version typed up for the opening of the doll. With no time left to uh, write an Irish translation, Pierce Beasley was left to do an impromptu translation pretending to read from the English text. As O'Kelly later recalled, the draft of the democratic programme was not submitted to any committee or indeed any individual except my wife. And Cahill O'Shannon noted that it wasn't until he and Johnson listened to the programme being read out in the doll that they realised it had been amended. But if a deal of the explicit socialism of the first draft was excised, it was not wholly eliminated. And the end result did not tr trouble Johnson, who wept with emotion as it was read out. So I'm just going to quote a, a couple of short excerpts here. So um, it says, we declared that the nation's sovereignty extends not only to all men and women of the nation, but to its material possessions, the nation's soil and all its resources, all the wealth and the wealth producing processes within the nation. And with him, um, we, we reaffirm all right to private property must be subordinated to the public right and welfare. We declare that uh, we desire our country to be ruled in accordance with the principles of liberty, equality, and justice for all, which alone can secure permanence of government in the willing adhesion of the people. We affirm the duty of every man and woman to give allegiance and service to the Commonwealth and declare it is the duty of the nation to assure that every citizen shall have the opportunity to spend his or her strength and faculties in the service of the people. In return for willing service, we, in the name of the Republic, declare the right of every citizen to an adequate share of the produce of the nation's labor. It shall be the first duty of the government of the Republic to make provision for the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of the children, to secure that no child shall suffer hunger or cold from lack of food, clothing, or shelter, but that all shall be provided with the means and facilities requisite for their proper education and training as citizens of a free Gaelic Ireland. So even the watered down version is a powerful declaration of the rights and duties of citizens and what is actually meant by a republic outside the instruments of statehood or government. The problem, however, at the time and since, however, uh, lies in the mens rea. So I just stuck a bit of Latin in there to sort of fit in. Um, the democratic programme was adopted by the first doll, uh, but few members of the first doll, if any, seem to have taken it particularly seriously, and the debate has raged for decades over whether the programme was genuine or merely opportunistic. Apart from the IRB opposition, not merely to its content, but to it being read at all. In later years, there were others, on the, particularly on the Cumann and Ale and Fine Gael side, who were openly contemptuous of it. Asked about the programme 50 years later in 1969, Ernest Blythe recalled, no, I never found anyone who took the slightest interest in it. The Labour Party secured the adoption of it. I don't think anybody, practically speaking, bothered with it afterwards. It was regarded as some sort of hoisting of a flag. It wasn't regarded as significant. Similarly, Pierce Beasley, who was on the Dáil Preparatory Committee and who read the Irish version to the, uh, to the Assembly, later wrote that it was doubtful whether the majority of members would have voted for it without amendment had there been any immediate prospect of it being put into force. Indeed, the first suggestions that this was the case came as early as April 1919. On the 4th of April, a motion pledging the Assembly to, quote, fair and full redistribution of vacant lands and ranches amongst uneconomic holders and landless men was withdrawn, and the land question was given over to consideration by a committee, suggesting that any practical efforts to put the programme into practice might be unwanted. The following week, when answering a question about social policy of the government, De Valera, the President of the Republic, who'd been in jail when the programme had been adopted, explained that, Quote, it was quite clear that the democratic programme contemplated a situation somewhat different from uh, that in which they now found themselves. They had the occupation of the foreigner in their country, 
And while that state of affairs existed, they could not put fully into force their desires and their wishes as far as the social programme was concerned. Furthermore, averting to his lack of involvement in the process, he said he had never made any promise to Labour because while the enemy was within the gates, the immediate question was to get possession of the country. After 1922, the British enemy had moved beyond the gates. Uh, but then the division on the uh, democratic program became more apparent. Cumin and Ailes' hostility towards it was clearly evident during the debates on the 1922 constitution. Drawing on the democratic program, Labour deputies endeavoured to have economic rights uh, to things such as food, shelter and education put into the 1922 constitution. But Kevin O'Higgins was adamant the constitution should include only fundamental rights. There would be no reference to citizens or their rights or duties. And when the debate moved to natural resources, O'Higgins accused Labour of trying to put communist doctrine into the Free State Constitution. When Tom Johnson countered that he, what he was suggesting was in the democratic programme, O'Higgins merely replied, that's not a constitution. In effect, Cumin and Ale and later Fine Gael opposed the democratic programme. Labour and some left Republicans supported it, and then there were others within the Republican movement, such as Liam Lynch or indeed De Valera, who paid it lip service, expressing the view that the democratic programme was fine, but not yet. Indeed, when Fianna Fáil was founded in 1926, it listed amongst its the seven objectives um, to carry out the democratic programme of the first doll, and this aim has only been removed from its Karoo very recently. The programme was never entirely forgotten, but it enjoyed something of a revival in the uh, late, mid to late 1960s, when its radicalism chimed with the spirit of social and political rebellion and the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising encouraged a return to the foundations of the modern state. Writing in 1969, the economist Patrick Lynch, who was then lecturing in UCD during the gentle revolution, I nearly called it the glorious one, um, <coughs> noted the changes in attitude which had begun in recent years when he says young people saw that there are individuals in all three parties who appear to have more in common with themselves and with the democratic program than with the policies of our political parties at the last election not that its appeal uh, was limited to the new generation either Sean Lamass referred to it in several speeches during his time as Taoiseach, and privately, at least, he had expressed a desire to restate its social objectives. Writing in 1964, Michael McInerney, the Irish Times political correspondent, suggested that Lamass planned to use the commemorations of the 1916 Rising to um, declare in 1966 terms the national aims as defined in the 1919 programme. And when the Taoiseach established an all-party committee on the Constitution that year, it looked as though that might happen, but ultimately it wasn't to be. The celebration surrounding 1966 emphasised the proclamation of the Republic, not its successor from the first all. Um, by, its uh, by its anniversary in 1969, it merely highlighted the, sti the state sins of omission. When members of the Oireachtas and distinguished guests met to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first Dáil's inaugural meeting. President de Valera's address had been interrupted with a shout. Someone roared, the program of the old Dáil has never been implemented. This is a mockery. Continuing by noting that a hunger strike in Mount Joy by a housing activist who had been imprisoned after he had refused to vacate the house in Mount Joy Square where he had been squatting with his wife and children. Significantly, the interruption came not from some young hothead, but an older man in the distinguished visitors section, Joseph Clark, who was a veteran of 1916 who'd fought on Mount Street Bridge under de Valera's command and had also been usher in charge of the first doll. Once Lamas had retired from politics, the document status diminished within Fianna Fáil and became almost exclusively identified with the left where it continued to be seen as a founding document of a republic that had failed to be. Beyond the Republican movement, 
where it was regarded highly in both the official and provisional wings. The left and the Labour Party um, especially, um, it, it fell out of favour. It was generally ignored, and when it was not ignored, it was derided. Writing in 1989, Mary Holland noted how the political parties achieved a new and rather depressing consensus when they agreed unanimously not to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the first doll, and suggested, um, and on a suggestion by a, a Labour senator uh, that the upper house marked the event, highlighting the importance of the democratic programme, uh, this prompted the NUI senator, Professor John A. Murphy, to declare that it was uh, a piece of eyewash. It was a mere window dressing. Five years later, however, the occasion was at least marked by RTE in a series of Thomas Davis lectures published as a collection uh, edited by Brian Farrell. And that emphasised the importance of 1919 as the bedrock of the modern Irish state. Politically, no one in recent times has identified so strongly with it as our president, Michael D. Higgins, who probably articulated his point best in his valedictory speech to Dáil Éireann in January 19, or 2011. On that occasion, he spoke of his belief that no real republic had been created in Ireland and pointed to the lack of citizenship, not only in Ireland, but in the European Union as a whole, and emphasised the need to rebuild an entirely new society based on political participation, administrative fairness, and the equality of the right to community, which included a floor of citizenship below which the people would not be allowed to fall. The picture he painted was of a radical inclusive republic, uh, and it was compelling, but as Deputy Higgins might lament, it was not new. The themes he set out in his speech were in effect a reiteration of the democratic program. Uh, and that was going to be the, the, um, at the heart of his presidential campaign. And he's returned to some of uh, those um, uh, themes in, in more recent speeches. Um, he, he finished his, uh, his speech by saying, um, by quoting the Shan Uckel Niniartgar Kor Lakela, translating it in terms that Tom Johnson would have understood in 1919, our strength lies in our common weal, in our social solidarity. At a recent series of history lectures on independent Ireland, I was intrigued to see historian after historian begin their talks with references to the democratic program. It was the start of every lecture. Um, and I think perhaps this is partly because it's so useful as a benchmark for what was left undone. Uh, and it serves as a largely as a reminder of the new state's sins of omission rather than anything else. Certainly it has no standing in Irish law beyond um, a sort of a moral one. I think perhaps it suffers or, or is, uh, has inflicted on it a degree of originalism. Uh, there's always a debate about what was meant by the authors, but then there's also the question of what was meant by the people who actually adopted it. Uh, but at the end of the day, as a, as a root of, um, what is this, a root? It's basically the 1919, uh, the first doll, it represents the high point of the Republic, if you like, uh, because it's the Republic with citizens in it. Um, and afterwards, what comes afterwards in 1922 and subsequently is that the state becomes primary, and the citizens are, are sort of uh, given second status. Um, and the republic also becomes contested after 1922. So the idea of a republic is, is questionable because people stand by the republic or they stand by the free state. But the idea of a republic of citizens uh, becomes something which is, is, is sort of lost along the wayside. And I think that is the case at least until 1949. Uh, when the Republic is declared, but by that point, for the citizens at least, it was far too late. Thank you.